Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 66, and our book is Dawn of Fire, The Wolf Time by Gav Thorpe. The book is about Robbie Bobby finally meeting up with Logan Grimnar and getting some Primaris for the Space Wolves. We posted several questions on our website for wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning. If you haven't yet read this book, definitely check out the book and our questions first, because we're going to be going over this in, from start to finish in great detail. With that, let's dive in. As always, did you like the book? Is this where the fight's going to start? Right here? Jen, Jen had a dream that when we were discussing this book, we got into a knockdown drag out. So, you, I mean, you might have a show tonight. It could be, could be interesting. I woke up so upset because we were like screaming at each other. So yes, this is where the fight's going to be. Okay. At. Um, you know, that's a really hard thing to ask me. Cause Should I, we start with more of softball questions? I, <laughs> sign? You know, I, I liked a lot of it. Um, I really had a big problem. Like it's to the point I'm actually wondering if the digital copies are different than what I had because there were quite a few instances where I would read something and be like, did I miss something? And I'd go back and read and like, no, I didn't miss anything. So either my book is missing some stuff or there was some bad editing in terms of what darlings were cut. There was some interesting editing. I can I can also say that too because I had that experience as well. Where all of a sudden I was like, "Well, but when did this happen?" And I think and I don't know. Like sometimes that like look, it works sometimes if like in a book, like, "Hey, Carrie came over. We're gonna go get coffee. We have our coffee now. Isn't that great?" Because you didn't necessarily need the details right. of us getting in my car and going to Dutch Brothers. Um, some of the stuff in here needed some details. Like all of a sudden so I was like, "But." When did that happen? So there was one that really stood out, like to the point I actually reread four chapters just to make sure okay. I did not miss anything. And this is when Moo Dyer is talking to, I believe, Robbie Bobby. And they're talking about the people they lost when they decided to divert and go to the ship. And he's like, we lost Alec. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. When did that happen? Went back, reread it. And I'm like, no, the last time we saw Alec, Alec was when... He yelled at her about, you know, is all of this worth the cost? And he did this big, you know, he did an amazing speech about what history really is. Like, I was on board with that. But and then he looked at her. She was about to burst into tears. He walks off. And then he says, I, we lost Alec. I'm like, when? Yeah. And when he talks about her dying in, like, the flames and, like, how yeah, and that how death he, will haunt him. Yes. I was like... Like, that's why I went back and read. I'm like, did I miss yeah. something? So, yeah. Like, that. I was, okay, I'm glad you said that. Okay. Because the same thing with the two, I, I thought I wrote this down, but the two astropaths early on in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, when they come in and they're like, oh, yeah, he clearly had to shoot them. And I was like, okay, sure. I mean, like, but that's kind of one of those things that I'm like, on one hand, okay, I can understand that you, you're you telling me that that happened. I didn't necessarily have to see it happen. But the way it's described made it sound like, yeah, you remember this one scene? Yes. And like, I'm like, like... When they talk about the smoking crater that was obviously from his gun, I'm like, what was it? I mean, because if you wanted to say that they you found them dead because her head exploded from everything, okay, I believe that. But there's an armsman in there. And there was a crater in the chest where he obviously had to shoot them. Like, that's not obvious to me. Like, well, and the way that they introduced him, like he's just sitting. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I actually hated this book. Um, and so I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I mean, that is I, honestly why on Goodreads I'm not going to give this book. I'm going to give this book only three stars because. Those two incidences are unforgivable. And 
to the, like mostly the one with Alec dying. Like if I okay, Alec one maybe was, with the navigators. Okay. I'll forgive it, but right, not. But when Alec happened, I was like, no, 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 no. no. Mm-mm, mm-mm. So again, I almost wonder if it's something wrong with the edition of this book. Something got left on the floor, or was some bad editing. Um, I mean, if, if anybody was reading the um, ebook version and or the audio version and what happened to Alec was mentioned in there, please let me know. The hardback version, like maybe it's just the limited edition is missing it. Yeah. I don't know. But yes, I second that. And because I hated this book so much, by the time I got to the end, I'll admit my, my attention was a little split in places. I went back and reread because I was like, oh, God, I, I must have skimmed over something. And I went back and, but actually, so we'll talk more about this later. The whole Bukhara sl- subplot, I got strong opinions. I got real strong opinions on it. But I hated this book. Really, there was like, there were a few things that I really liked. Uh, there were two lines in here, which I've already written down in my notes is for being of the best quotes of the year because they made me laugh out loud. One of them made me belly laugh. That was good. I liked some of the concepts at play, but overall, really hated this book. Yeah, it was um, very slow at first, but I had to remind myself that all the Dawn of Fire slow. books are slow. Even the Andy Clark book that was really good, it was it was slow. That's true. But but then man, it got somewhere. But then I, was like, I think I even texted you. It was like at page one sixty, and I was like, "Who oh boy, I am in." Yes, and that's because that's when they said, oh yeah, Robbie Bobby's going to come and have a chat. And I was like, oh, I am like, okay, because the way that they framed it at the very beginning, like as soon as they're talking about the Primaris Marines, their instant reaction is, oh, the Legion Breaker has returned. I was like, oh, that's yeah. right. They would hate him for that. That's kind of interesting. So mm-hmm. I, I was really curious about the dynamic there between Robbie Bobby coming back and how the wolves would partake in it and I got a really interesting you know point of view of how the wolves kind of see themselves in the Imperium um in many ways this book kind of undid what Chris Rate patched with me and my feelings for the space wolves you think uh yeah uh just um, that's the meat of why I hated this book so much because you didn't like the wolves being a bunch of babies a bunch of edgelord, petulant assholes. And that, I don't know if Gav Thorpe just has written The Dark Angel so long, he has a natural distaste for the Space Wolves, but this Logan Grimnar is not the Logan Grimnar that stood on an Inquisitor's vessel while an Inquisitor explained to him that he would turn over all of these people right fucking now or else he'd kill them all and eliminate the Space Wolves. And without saying a word, Logan Grimnar just kills the Inquisitor, doesn't make a grand speech, doesn't throw his toys around the room, he just acts. That is not the Logan Grimnar that's in this book. This Logan Grimnar is a petulant child who can't stop throwing his toys around the room. That scene with him and Bob sitting down talking, I was wanted to rip pages out of the book. Where he's like, Bob's like, oh, I'm going to give you the Primaris. Oh, but you're not going to tell us how to make them. No, no, no. We're going to give you all the technology to make them too. Oh, so this is going to be a cage for us. No, 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 no. I just want you to go off and fight the orcs like you've always fought the orcs. And that's going to be your leash on us. You know, the funny thing is, so I knew you were going to take it that way when I got to that part. Hated I was like, it. It's like, oh my gosh. Hated it. Um, I, I knew, but, you know, that's what I've always thought of the Space Wolves back when I read um, A Thousand Suns. They were very, um, you know, and we've it's always, a we've always problem. Known, we've always known that the space wolves were going to do their own thing. You know, like when Rob very much came so. up with the Codex Astartes, and the Wolf King was like, <laughs> "No, and, no, exactly." But you know, it was like Nial actually made a really good point. He's like, he's like, yes, he broke up the legions, but he didn't force us to. Like he didn't come down here and force us. 
it that was... was the thing that infuriated me because and that was the thing that i kept screaming at the book especially when bjorn is like the legion breaker like yeah but he handed the book at you lehman russ was like jokes on you i can't read and bob was like i and walks off even though he never knew perfectly and... well that he he could read he was just like oh whatever Right. I mean, like, he knew that he wasn't going to, and he didn't force it. Mostly because he kind of knew that the Space Wolves, or it was very much my interpretation of it, because of just some of the comments he'd made, is that he knew that the Space Wolves, their gene seed's a little unstable, right? Like, you're not going to be, maybe you're not going to be making a whole lot of successor chapters. Like, he kind of knew, and he didn't fight it. It wasn't like with Rogel Dorn, where he's like, you need to do the thing. And Lionel Johnson, you need to do the thing, right? Like, even with Korax, he was like, you need to do the thing. But he even had a softer touch there. Like, but this is a bigger problem with the Black Library in general. And I've always said this because, again, I think everyone knows my favorite Legion is the Iron Warriors. Depending on which author you have, you get two very different Legions in the space. Base Wolves, I think, are now the number one contender of that. Depending on the author, you got a different Legion. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I totally see what, what you're saying. I guess all that I'm saying is that I've seen this kind of thing before with Space Wolves. Now, again, it was with uh, Graham McNeil when mm-hmm. when he was writing him. And even a little bit in Dan Abnett's, the, um, gosh, it's a Prospero, Prospero Burns. You know, yeah. it, I mean, he he even kind of had them that that same way. But, you know, what I took this as being, because honestly, because the Space Wolves had just dealt with Magnus. They had dealt with the Inquisition. They dealt with the Grey Knights. They dealt with the Dark Angels going, look at them. Forget what we're doing. Look, right. look at them. They just dealt with all of that. And now here is the Legion Breaker coming in they're like oh here's somebody else who's going to try to tell us what to do i think there was a huge there was that going on now i do not know why bjorn was woken up for a few lines literally two pages because yeah. it feels like i feel like at this point because it's just i thought he would be at as the meeting. one has to do i thought he would be at the meeting with robbie bobby so that they could hash it out someone who actually you know they knew one another they could talk it out you know, yeah. uh, I just so okay. We've got a few things to go through here. So <laughs> too down deep down a rabbit hole. Let's start with what parts stood out to you. Like, what were some of the things that you? I'll I'll say really quickly the two things that made me laugh really hard because I have to give credit where credits due. First off, when Moraven Guard Hurak, when he's talking about, I think it's on page two hundred where he's like, yeah. Uh, Everything that I've read about the Raven Guard is really depressing and morose. And he's like, but I'm just sure over the years, Korax's witticisms were rubbed down, worn down and rubbed off. And I was like, funny. oh, honey. And then, but the best line in here that I will cherish forever is on page 227. I hated Mudir, Mudir, Mudir's character. I hated him. And that whole petulant, I don't like you because I couldn't be a custodies scene I didn't like. But when when oh. Vakellen when Vakellen is like, look, we are crafted and molded. Like our personalities and everything about me was like formed and forged and there is nothing. Like I have no free will and blah 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 blah. And Mudir's like, So that means at some point someone decided Colquan needed to be an asshole. Yes. That actually made me laugh out loud as well i laughed so hard well and especially because they talked about like helen laughing so hard because like you can imagine because they talk about how the custodies are so big and their voices are so big the idea of a custodies laughing so loud it's hurting the historian's ears mm-hmm. is amazing yeah i almost and wonder just, if gav thorpe laughed out loud writing that i have to imagine he did and i almost feel like he did that a little intentionally like, yeah, yeah this probably. guy's a dick, and somebody did that on tent and purpose. Loved that. That made me laugh really hard. So there was a couple of things that made me stand, that made me, that stood out to me. Uh, one was when Robbie Bobby made his entrance to the World Eaters. It's like, he does know how to make The guy's entrance. like, 
no, 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 we don't want you down there. But why? And Bob just jumps out. Killing everybody on the way down and then just running through. Just eh, He's like, eh, world eaters. I've dealt with them before. <laughs> Nothing has changed. You know, do you know what short story I want really badly? Hmm. So over Christmas, we showed my daughter Deadpool for the first time, the first one. And do you remember that scene when he runs into the Merc that he used to know? And he's like, I haven't seen you since TGI Fridays. Oh, right. And he talked about, like, uh, like how's your wife? Love her tuna casserole. Really fattening. Yeah. I love that. I want that scene. Like, I want Bob to be on a battlefield fighting and all of a sudden be like, John? Man, I haven't seen you since this battle. Ha! Huh? Good times. And kill him, obviously. But I just kind of like him to all of a sudden just have that moment of, I know you, and I know you, and I know you. I mean, we kind of got that with Abaddon and Sigismund. Kind of. Kind of. But I want that with Bob. Like, I want him to just be like, mm-hmm, I remember you. So that was like, but there's a lot of things that I really liked about just learning about the space wolves. Like, I loved, like, on page 154, I think it's when Gaius was talking about, you know, the rules in the Codex and, you know, that the Codex says this. And basically they're like, yeah. They basically admitted, we don't follow the Codex. We ignore the Codex. And he's just so shocked ab about it all. Um, you know, and uh, how they view the Imperium. Like, they don't... Yeah. They don't act like they're part of the Imperium. They kept saying, our Imperial allies. And I thought that was just very interesting. That they just view themselves so separate. They're very cultural. So... Yeah. A really good friend of mine. But, oh, they're so snobby about it. They kind of are. So a really good friend of mine is, she was born and raised here. Um, I think one of her parents is Japanese, but she was born and raised here. She went to Japan. She got married. She's had children. She's been there for like 30 years. But she said, she's like, I am not Japanese. And everybody around me lets me know. I've been here. I'm married. My kids. I'm not Japanese. They are, though. It's like, because Japan has a very strong cultural identity. And I really, like, reading this book, especially with Gaius, I felt the same way. That I was like, oh man, like, you've got that blood and you're going to grow, you're going to battle with these guys, but you are not Fenrisian. And they are, I think though, you see a little bit of that with the Blood Angels too. Like, anybody who grows up on a death world, who has that strong cultural, like, we survived this planet. I feel like they all kind of have that. <laughs> no, no, you're not from here, though. We saw that a little bit in the Emperor's Gift, because remember that Inquisitor was Fenrisian, and she used to make comments, too, where she's like, well, you don't understand, because you're not Fenrisian. So I guess that actually feeds directly into your point that, yeah, it's a little arrogant. Well, very much so. And here is guys who just wants to learn. And what are they all doing? They're making fun of him at every turn. And I just felt so bad for the guys. He just wanted to be a part of something. And they kept saying, stop being something that you're not. You're not one of us and you never will be. Well, because that wouldn't hurt somebody's feelings. They don't think that way. But I guarantee you insult them. Say he didn't think that way, though. No, but you insult them. And that's like, okay, now we have to, like, you know, cut each other for it. And they don't right. see how that's a possible insult. So, which really goes back to how it was felt about the space holes from back in A Thousand Suns. When that rune priest was saying, what you're doing is not right, but I'm fine. I'm fine doing the pretty much the same things. And it's one thing I really liked in here is when they talked about, you know, the, the psychers and, you know, and guys like, yes, they, the Fenrisians believe that spirit of the planet, whereas the Imperium's like, no, that's not, that's not what it is. I'm like, thank you for justifying everything I have been saying for a long time. Imperium also says that demons don't exist. So keep that in mind. Not the people who deal with psychers, but anyway. Um, oh, page 297. Little casual mention about the custodians, what they did with the 11th Legion. Along with uh, the Space Wolves? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. But mostly, yeah. really, this book, it really highlighted to me a lot, even though Robbie Bobby was only in certain parts of it, how he understands the way things work. He knew he was never going to pressure, you know, Lehman Russ to break up the Legion. Mm -hmm. He knew that was never oh, going to yeah. work. 
He was never going to try to get Logan Grimnar to bow the knee, which is why he bowed to him. He's like, I'm on your planet. I understand how this works. For me to get anything from you, I'm going to have to show humility to you because I am on your planet. Mm -hmm. Um, And... You know, just how he, yeah, just like how he really can understand, he understands how this crusade is going to go. And it just kind of showed like more examples of how he thinks so many moves ahead. You know, talk about Gulliman in general in this book, because the Dawn of Fire series is interesting because Gulliman is not, he was a main character in the first book. And he's arguably the main character of all of these books. But just like Gate of Bones, he basically shows up for like maybe 30 pages total He's his presence looms over these stories, but he's not Which necessarily I love directly. That. I love that because they talk about how you know you can't even look at him in the eye because his presence is just so great. You know, and- I actually loved when Bjorn went off about that, and he's like, "These guys were designed for us to not be able to say no, and they're designed for you to be in awe of them." I really did like that. Yeah. I mean, like, he's right. He ain't wrong. I, yeah. <laughs> Right? Like, he's not wrong. It, so... Yeah, so glad that they spent four hours, you know, waking you up just for you just to walk off into the sunset again for... All right. On one hand, it was kind of within Bjorn's character to just be like, I'm out. I got nothing to say to this guy. I'm out. Um, On the other, yeah, it was like, why did we bother with this? Like, he's just echoing what they're already saying like it would be one thing if he came up and he was like i have this one piece of wisdom to impart upon you and now i'm gonna go back to sleep because i don't care but he didn't i I actually felt that way about a lot of the stuff in this book because like the cardinal bukaris thing doesn't he anyways focusing sorry gulliman so what did you think like in general about his approach at the space wolves like his, his deal that he's making the fact that he does understand them and kind of her speech that he makes which I was so proud when Gulliman was like that's my boy <laughs> I mean Gulliman just once again just handled everything exactly the, w- the way that he needed to handle it he was handling Colquan exactly the way that Colquan needed needed to be handled you know is you know and I really loved it when Colquan and even um by Kellen and Her- Herak were kind of bobbing. They're like, we don't need them. Just let them go. We have other people we can give these primaries to. And he was like, no. It's like the first founding is very important, and I'm not leaving them out of this. But he was also. I loved. Oh, go ahead. I was like, but he also knew that. And that's actually one thing I really liked what he's done with the Primaris is that yes, he's giving the Primaris Marines, and he's going to teach them how to make their own, and then just you know just go but hey but we're trying to reunite reunite the imperium again but he knows that's not the green case with the wolves but he still wants to help him and i think deep down it's because he loves his brother he's not going to let his brother's legion go behind and gulliman and the horus heresy anyway showed great respect for lehman lehman russ very much so. Like, and Lehman Russ would always act like he didn't care about Gulliman, but you could tell that with the banter and everything, Lehman, he was a very smart guy. I'm never going to say that Lehman Russ was not smart. He was extremely smart. He knew how to work Gulliman. Gulliman knew how to work him. Lehman Russ knew how to work Fulgrim. Very much so. <laughs> I I think the thing I liked about Gulliman, like, I love, I love Gulliman as the diplomat. I love him even more as the teacher. So, like, when he's, like, when Hurric is just like, look, I can't see why we need the Space Wolves. And he goes, disappointing. Right. And Hurric is like, oh, God. But then when he's giving that speech and he looks over at Gulliman and Gulliman's like, you're getting it. It reminded me a lot of what Chris, in Hellwinter Gate, right? When he's like, look, if you mention Lehman Russ and the Space Wolves, people smile. Mm -hmm. They know him. And when Hurric is like, look, we can't let you die because even if we can replace you with primaris space marines people will know like the story of the og space wolves getting out and getting killed will get out and this will be well this is these are the space wolves but these are the new space wolves not the venrisian space wolves these are the new ones and they're not going to be the same thing they're the we have space wolves at home 
We have the great value space walls. <laughs> exactly. Maybe Archer Farms. But yeah, pretty much. But which is why they're like, well, no, we're going to teach you how to do this. So you can still bring Fenrisians in here. It's fine. Well, and I liked when Gulliman is like, look, it's going to take a lot. Or I can't remember if it was him or her. When he's like, it's going to take forever to train these Primaris Marines to be leaders, to be chapter masters, to be these important. Like, we're not going to just replace right. Njal Stormcaller. We are not going to just replace Arjak or Ulrich. None of these guys can just be, like, swapped. So you're talking, like, your fear is, like, 300 years down the road. Which, okay. But, you know, I mean, Ulrich is, he's an anomaly with how old he is. <laughs> right. I mean, he's probably going to become Bjorn too, Electric Boogaloo, but it. Bah, I liked Gull I, I liked that this did remind everybody that. Oh, by the way, Gulliman is a master diplomat. Well, I think they said that Logan Grimnar has been the Great Wolf for six hundred years, and we know that Ulrich found him as Rained a young him. young kid, as it came apparent when he picked up. Um, Githa's son uh, at, at the end of the book but so I mean he could be as old as Dante or even older yeah wow and talk he very about, well could be talk about you know uh, vampires versus werewolves they don't have nice things to say about Dante by god I was like shit what did Dante do to you guys yeah, uh, Colquan didn't have anything that was nice Cole to say about Quan, him either. Space yeah, I was going to say, Colquan did not have anything nice to say about him, which was... But I I think... I actually hated Colquan in this book. I hated what he did with him. Um, but Because he was always kind of a butthead and a naysayer, which was understandable. But in this, he's like obsessed with trying to hate Gulliman and obsessed with trying to kill him. And that whole... I found that whole like intro scene to be so garish. But... I did like that when he's like, do not confuse Dante for Sanguinius. Well, okay. You know what? You got a point there. Like, right. I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know to what end you're telling him this. Because he didn't but you're even not say wrong. Sanguinius. He just said Dante. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, where are you going with this, bro? Right. So let's, let's talk about Gaius a bit because he's arguably the mainest character of the book. Yeah. Um, What did you think about his journey? I don't know. I liked half of it. I, I really don't know. Um, I just felt bad. You know, it was almost kind of this. It, it, this would have been like a meet the parents thing where it's like very cringe comedy. Like, oh, my God, I just feel so bad for him. Um, but I think it was also just, you know, again, like the space wolves are just being the space wolves are being obnoxious little pricks. Like, oh, like, yes, there's only 700 of us. You can't join our cool kids club because you're not. See, I thought that was so fucking dumb. Again, with other books that we've read, I'm like, these are, these are not the same people. These are just not the same people and who are proud. You're never going to be like one of the cool kids, but you know, we'll accept your help. Come on. Well, but you I know, expected but like, more of that. But like Olier and um, and Dragon Gaze. Dragon Gaze is all on board. It's like this is awesome. I love Crom. Crom's like, yes. Although, you know, Grimnar, what he was going to do to Crom, kind of exited stage left and never got brought up again. But it's just another I, thing. I wonder if Gav Thorpe, like, actually took a step back and was like, okay, this is just petty for pettiness sake. Like, okay, maybe I took that a little too far. But I liked again. half of Gaius's journey. I loved the whole, like, when he's like, Fenrika Holda. And they're like, oh, God, the Imperial accent, right? Like... I loved that. Um, I hated that it was like 150 pages just for him to discover that maybe space wolves don't come from a store. Maybe being a space wolf means just a little bit more. Like, did you really just waste 150 pages to for him to go on the journey to realize that there's more to being a space wolf than just having Lehman Russ's gene seat? Are you kidding me? Especially after he gave that awesome speech before he jumps out of the Thunderhawk. I thought that was amazing. And at that point, the Space Wolves were just being petty and mean. At that point, they were... I think I liked it because that's kind of in their nature. But they did take it that step too far. 
And I love the other, when he's like... The other just that they did earlier, that was fine. That was totally within their idiom. But when he's like, hey, I made this talisman just for you. And he's like, oh, my God. It's like, you gave me a present. That's so cool. And everyone's snickering and laughing at him. I'm like, okay, you know what? I've been that kid. Nobody likes to be that kid everyone's laughing at. I was. It reminded me of bridesmaid's humor to your awkward point. Yes, yes. It, it was it was bridesmaidy, and I did not like that. Um, which is why I loved his speech when he's like, "Call broke you down to the genetic level, and there's no magic fairy dust. You just are. You're not special." And then he pieces out. I was like, "I that's loved, amazing." Loved that speech. I was I like, like, "Thank you." You just speech. told him like, "You are not the special snowflakes. You all think." That, that you are oh you grew up in this but, this harsh but then we had another hundred pages to prove that they really are special snowflakes i don't know if that was really what it is because he because they're like well he's dead yeah no he survived one of the things that i liked is when they're like we have to go rescue him and he's like you and Uller is like you want to dishonor him like that after that exit, you want to go and dishonor him by then embarrassing him further by rescuing him? Like, I did like that. I liked that because you could tell that Uller kind of realized, right? He's like, well, he's either going to survive and be a badass or he's going to die and he's going to learn. Well, Very I, space wolfy. But I also saw it as not only is he proving that you guys have no right to judge me. I can do this, which he did ultimately prove. But I think it also just showed, you know, don't underestimate the Primaris just because we didn't grow up on a death world. Don't, yeah, well, think, and also, don't think we can't hack it. The thing that I liked about it was that it was also showing, like, look, you just got to teach us. Like, put us through the trials if you want. The, the Morkai trials mm-hmm. that you guys do. Like, if we die, we die. If we survive, we can prove we can do it. Like, when they're all like, he killed a black man? Yeah, like all you have to do is give them the chance, like give them the chance to prove themselves. And I really loved at the end, he's got a name, like he has a a real Fenrisian name. Mm -hmm. Like it's no, he wasn't born there. And I mean, I did like when the guy explains, he's like, look, you've never done the things that we've done, which is how we fight the way that we fight because we grew up doing this. But it can be taught, my friends. That's but that, that's what I mean. That's why I really like his journey at the end. And just that, no, the Space Wolves aren't special. They aren't these special snowflakes because he can do it. Yeah. Well, it just, you just have to give them the chance. And But like, it's like, like, I didn't need a like, hundred pages of that. Like the whole fighting. But they're like, well, how do you do that? And then they were showing them how they did that. And they all figured it out. It's like, stop being assholes. And just teach them. Don't just assume because, oh, they weren't born here. They weren't born Pretty much. here. They can't handle things with our peekies out. Well, the thing that was really funny is it actually made me think of that scene in Ragnar Blackmane by ADB when he's doing when he's doing the duel. Finally does the duel between at the end between him and the Dark Angel. Mm-hmm. And they talk about how the Dark Angels are all noses in the air, pinkies out on their swords, mm-hmm. right? Because they're just more refined it's nothing personal they're just better than the space wolves who are all like yelling like they're at a college brawl right but it was this great scene of like look how like look how we juxtapose one another and how nicely we actually can come together i always love that Mm -hmm. but it's kind of funny because i thought back to that scene because i was like yeah you guys are acting like the dark angels right now like, it's nothing personal, we're just better than you because we were born and raised here. You weren't born into the wrong, the right family, darling. Right. Like, you're just never going to be one of us. It it was so pissy. And I don't think, I think like Uller, I think if you would have worded it that way to him, been like, ah, yeah, just like the Dark Angels. He would have been like, I'm sorry, what? And he would have taken offense and killed you for it because they can dish it out, and but they can't take it. Which again, yes, was my problem with them back in a thousand suns. Right, I, yeah, it was an interesting journey. I, I don't. It felt really long winded. Where I was like, okay, so you remember how you were like, I don't. You always say you don't like plots that you've seen before. 
I don't like plots that I can suss out. So as soon as he was like, oh, I'm never going to be one. I looked at the page count and was like, oh, he's going to go experience all of these things that he just listed. And right. Oh, yeah, look, sure enough, there it is. Like, as soon as I figured out that that's what was going to happen, I was like, oh, thanks for boring me with it. I didn't like that. That's fair. Let's bounce over to a human story real quick. Were you invested? I don't want to. We have to. Okay, because it's like half the book. Um, Which were you in part. invested in Orad's story? Let's t- let's start with All Orad. Right, so Orad, that was interesting. So I will say every time that popped up, I was like, I need to know where we're going with this. Um, I Do I under- care about this? Are we I caring about this? That being a slave on an orc ship sucks. All right. Yeah. I mean, I really didn't need like to hear about this. I you know. Did I think it was sweet and a morbid kind of way that any of his crewmates who died, he made a necklace out of their finger bones and carved into it their name and serial number and stuff so that he could share that. Um, and morbid, but what else was he going to do, to be totally honest? It's not like he had like a, no- much. a notebook hanging around. Um, it, it's, it's arguably pretty permanent. But I also say when the com- the big climax happened with it, I was like, okay, this is kind of fun. Right. All it just took was just one moment when he realized, did you want to die like this? I was like, fuck no. I'm going to die going down fighting. Right. I'm, so first off, can I, can I just say that after the books that we've read, Brutal Cunning and Gosgul Thraka and the Red Gobbo, I had a serious disconnect in those first few chapters because I'm like, the orcs aren't scary. They're funny. Why are these guys acting like monsters? They're, oh, wait, right. No, they're awful. <laughs> I had this huge disconnect. They're terrifying. Cause we... Well, because we've read so many right. stories from their point of view where they're just funny and comical and they talk cockney and they don't understand. And it was... uh. So I, I really kind of, I actually, on one hand, I really appreciated Orad's story because I was like, oh yeah, no, these guys are horrifying and they need to be killed because it gets really easy when you're reading again with like, especially with Mike Brooks and Nate Crowley, like, funny, why are we scared of these guys? Oh, <laughs> right. right. They do so I have like a major things. disconnect. Yeah, They do. I found the chapters to be pretty long winded. I almost started skimming them because I'm like, this is so this is bad. I think what other complaint about the book is that it felt like okay, I'm going to mention a movie that doesn't exist, but bear with me here, okay? It felt like Spider-Man 3, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Right, the movie that was never made. Okay, I gotcha. Where there was almost just too much going on yes we got the night lords and it's the world eaters oh wait it's the orcs I'm like who are we fighting and what is going on like it was too much too much i will like, agree like, with that a hundred percent like honestly the whole night lords thing probably didn't even need to be in there could it removed the only thing that we gleaned from that is that gaius is real excited to go meet his people and Gaius is good at killing things. Okay, that that's cute. So is every other Primaris Marine. Right, exactly. Like it like, would have been more of a I'll story give a pass if he wasn't to the World Eaters, just because that was a badass entrance by Robbie Bobby. But that's about it. Um, yeah, because really, it's such a shame because like I really enjoy Gav Thorpe's writing, and I enjoy the way he tells stories, and there was just. So much in this I felt was just handled incorrectly, mostly by editing. I, I'm not saying that Gav Thorpe's not as a bad writer. I'm not saying this book was bad. Gav Thorpe's writing style just doesn't click with me. Right, and right. And that's fine. As I had to do some soul searching one night on Reddit, I discovered that ADB's writing style doesn't click with everyone. I'm yeah. still a little shook. No, but look, I get it. Not like not every book and not every author is for everybody. Gavthorpe's style just doesn't click with me. So I'm actually kind of relieved to hear you say the thing about the editing, because at first I was like, oh, God, this is why I don't like Gavthorpe. 
But I think you might be right. I think he might have been a little really good Gav Thorpe books. I mean, I loved. Mm-hmm. I know you didn't like Ashes of Prospero, but um, I really liked Angels of Darkness. I've liked um, any of the Dark Angels books that he that he's written and, and I've read. Um, so I know he can be succinct. I think this almost he almost was. Gaius is almost a self insert. I think in that. Gaius is so overly excited and Gav Thorpe is so overly excited to be a part of this. Which is kind of fun. I would agree. But at the same time, it's like, okay, but we do have to work on some of the editing. And obviously the editing is not one of, is not Gav Thorpe's fault. No, I will say, you know, I hadn't considered Gaius as a self-insert, but the more that I you say that. now. <laughs> you know what? I think you're 100% correct. And it actually explains a lot of some of the bad aspects and the space wolves being presented in a really bad light. And it's not, look, I'm not casting aspersions at Gav Thorpe. Not everybody likes every Legion. I hate the thousand suns and the dark angels. Not saying they're bad legions. They're just not my people. Right. Like it's not a bad thing, right? You love them Mm -hmm. because they're, they're, that's the point of having so many legions is so that people will find things that click with them. Right. Right. And, uh, but yeah, this was, there was some editing stuff in here and I felt like Orad and you're, you're right, especially the Night Lords. That section, when I first started reading it, I was first excited because Night Lords. I did snicker when they talked about the bat wings on the helm. It's like, that's just funny. Yeah. But and actually the Night Lords are great because like that fit in line with a bunch of anyways. But yeah, as soon as that chapter was over and they were never like halfway, like I, I want to say like maybe 30 or 40 pages more, I was like. Oh, that was that. That's never going to be mentioned again. Oh no. Same with the. There was actually a bunch of stuff in here about that. So here's my other thing that I think comes down to editing, and we're going off a little off track here for a second. But the whole Bukaris thing. So they go and they ask y'all Stormcaller, hey, what about Bukaris? And oh, okay, sit down, sit down. So it's like four pages of him telling these stories, but ultimately he has nothing to tell them. And even then, I feel like Gav Thorpe forgot about that because it never. I actually think that's totally within the Space Wolves idiom, too. We have these sagas. I'll tell you, I'll just sit and spin a tale with you. Not saying it's going to have anything meaningful. And I almost thought that was more of a teaching moment for the historians than anything else. Like, you guys are not going to find what you want here because we we don't record things the way that you do. I did like, I will say along those lines, I did like, because it could have been a, t- a little bit of a teaching moment, because remember, Col or not Colcon, Vic- Vicarian, I cannot say anybody's Vicellan. names today, I'm Vicellan. having problems tonight, he um, he was like, well, we just need to know about everything you know about Bukharis, so of course, Nyal's going to be like, well, I'm going to tell you this saga, and then finally, when they're like, well, that doesn't help us, well, maybe if you had been more specific, oh, and that was the first time Vicellan was like, oh, so... Well, this is what happened, and this is what, and then, and that's when y'all is like, "Oh, no, I can't really help you in that." Like, had you, had you led with that? But I felt like at the end of the book, it almost felt like it was like again with Alex's death, it felt like it was appended in there. Like he got to the end, and they were like, "But what about Bukaris?" Oh, right. Oh, they, they learned this. Here you go. Dude died. Like, it did feel a little bit like maybe it was kind of an editing nightmare there. I Well, did you read his intro? Yes. We talked about... I actually did. I think he mentioned in his intro that... I do like that these, while you're looking for that, I do like that these are all going to be direct sequels. Not just taking place in the same universe. Right. Not just in the same timeline. These are direct sequels. Like, we're talking about Gathalamor. We are talking about what happened with this weapon. Sad thing is, like, when they're talking about Gathalamor, I was like, what the hell is that? Oh, right, it's what Gate of Bones was about, duh. I had that same thought where I was like, ooh, when were they on Gathalamor? And then they talked about the Cardinal, and I was like, oh, like the, la- oh, like the last book. Okay. Um, so he talks about how basically the goal was a hundred thousand words and it ended up being closer to 150,000 words and he probably could have written another 30,000 words so it sounds like to me that he wrote a lot 
And when the editors went through it and were cutting things and rearranging things, that they didn't keep track of what they were cutting and rearranging. Right. I think you might be right. So along those lines, were you invest well were you invested in Geetha's story? Yes. Actually, were you? I I thought at first. At first I was like, God, what the hell do I care about these yeah, Finn regions, but no. Uh, as it went on, and I saw where this was going, but you know, they talked about how they, you know, had been here too long. They should have been migrating a while ago. Well, now, now we all are. Um, I kind of like that whole idea of them, and of course, and then it all came together in the end when her son gets picked, you know, to, to possibly go, I, go be a sky warrior, which they pretty much telegraphed from the beginning. Oh, which I, I was like, ugh. I didn't pick that up. So so the thing about Geetha that I thought was interesting, her chapters really did bore the hell out of me, but the thing I thought was interesting, this whole book is about how the, the space wolves chafe at imperial rules and regulations and interventions and blah, blah, blah. But when she's like, oh, I'm going to the black ships. Oh, okay. Oh, Okay, like, so I, I honestly... you hate all rules and you hate all interventions and blah, blah, blah. But the second they're like, I mean, I, I promised I'd go to the black ships. You're like, oh, you got to do what you got to do. Like, even though she made an oath and I know how they're big they are on their oaths and everything. They are big on oaths. I was still surprised that they let her go. Yeah. Really did not fit what had just been established in this book. Mm -mm. And honestly, I kind of got a little pissy with that band of, uh, I guess, like, what, his, like, Imperial Guard, Honor Guard, or whatever, who's, like, scouring the area. I was like, you guys, you guys do understand that you can't be making these rules on, on, on this planet. Like, I'm pretty sure Robbie Bobby, like, explained that to you, that this is not your typical Imperial planet, because they don't almost consider themselves part of the Imperium. And in many yeah, ways, it and makes I would... sense. Because the only thing that they have to offer the Imperium are the Space Wolves. There's yeah. nothing on that planet to feed Terra or create things or mm -mm. anything like that. Because it's a death world. No. Kind of like Ball. Ball's the same way. There's nothing that they can do on Ball. Pretty much. Unless they just All want of the to death donate world, right? the living water of death. Like, here's a bioweapon. Pretty much, right? <laughs> um, I... I don't know why her story did not click with me. It didn't grab me. The best thing that I can say about her is if you have the limited edition, hmm. that might be some of the most badass art yeah. that we've seen in Warhammer 40k in a long time. Especially for a like, regular human, right? Yeah. The whole thing is just gorgeous. Um, and I did love that. I just, her story, I don't know why it never clicked with me. Every chapter I was like, oh, okay, maybe this will be the, no, it's just not working for me. I don't know why. I guess the vision thing, I guess I struggle with the whole vision thing in general. And y'all Stormcaller is not one of my favorite characters. It's really funny is that I liked him in this book more than I did in chris rates because in chris rates books i thought he's like such an asshole <laughs> like such a self-righteous asshole and he actually seemed uh i don't know that he was actually willing to think but i think it, maybe that was because logan grimnar was not willing to think because he was letting his anger and his what he thought was happening blind him to what was going on although i did find it really funny that you know ulrich the whole time was just like, ah, not the Imperium, screw this. And then they found Primaris Marines. Like, well, hold on, let, let, let's hear the guy out. Like, this is interesting. Let's at least listen. Like, we could use this. Like, we only have 700 left. Like, we could really use the help. It was well, because Ulrich, Ulrich is very much an opportunist, right? Like, he understands. He's a realist, I guess I would mm. say. So I did like that. And I liked that Arjak had really mixed feelings on it and was like i don't want to be here i'm just gonna go back to the forge like don't put these adult decisions on me find <laughs> right. an adultier adult in a and y'all i didn't like y'all in this book because he was so 
wishy-washy. Like, where is Ragnar and all this? Yeah, Ragnar shows up as basically silent. Like he's there at the end when they call in all of the um, right, all of but, the Jarls. But but I just would have thought like Bobby Bobby coming. Hey, we need you here. You're one of the great wolves. Like you're one of the wolf lords. You you need to be here right now. Like like yesterday, right now. He was at the end, but it. But not he might it, as well not have been right. Not when he, that one, not when it was like really, really important for all the wolves. It felt like a checklist. There. Like, oh, by the way, like these six people are here. Anyways, these are the three people well, who are actually going to be the talking. You know, I was like, oh, and part of the reason why I felt like you know this was like a little bit like Spider Man Three is like look at the freaking dramatis, you know, dramatis persona. I find it's best not to. It's so, huh. Just saw two names like wow we only saw them in the beginning and never heard of heard from them again yeah right. like they pretty much went through the entire cast it anyway so let's so let me ask you this, this is why i say i'm mixed like i really liked a lot of it but this book has a lot of problems it does let me ask you this kind of going back to orad this adds a considerable menace to the orcs right like, that's a pretty big deal. Did the orcs need that? Do you find that compelling? Did they need what? The rigorous? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think because... This ability to pull entire ships out of orbit, out of the warp? Well, I mean, because they were using it, you know, as a beacon to get, you know, Imperials kind of like, haha, <laughs> fooled you. Gotcha. Which is totally something that the, the, that the orcs... That the orcs would Let's do. Let's be real, right? Um, so yeah, I mean that seemed to that seemed to fit, especially if they're trying to go these preparations for the return of Gazkul Thraka. I I struggle with it because on one hand I'm totally with you. Like the idea that you could pull an entire ship out of the warp is very much within their idiom, right? That they're just like I imagine them being like fishermen, <laughs> almost <laughs> right? Like gotcha, <laughs> like that's and that. It's very orky. I very much like it. But I'm also kind of like, God, they're already an unstoppable killing fungus. Sentient fungus. Like, they're, the orcs are terrifying in their numbers and their brutality. And their really difficult nature to kill, right? Like, did they really need to have this, too? It. I really... I yes. feel that way... <laughs> I guess so, yeah. I mean, you have a space hulk, you're gonna have to either you have a space hulk, you got one or two things. You have orcs or you have pteranids. I'll take the orcs over nids any day. Well, geez, like that's a no brainer. Orcs every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Miss me with the nids. Or gene hey, you stealers. Know what the... Whatever. Uh, no more gene stealers. Bad words. Four letter word now. Um oh, so we're not it. reading the next Caiaphas Kane book, because I'm pretty sure I mean, I just would think that would have <laughs> gene stealers in that somewhere. Yeah, probably, actually. Anyways, we're going to still read, because there's actually a book that looks very interesting coming out about the goddamn gene stealers. Anyways. But I I kind of feel that way about the Nids. I think I went on that rant where I was talking about how I'm like, they're almost becoming a little too OP. Mm -hmm. I feel like the orcs are balancing now on being a little OP, especially if Gosgul Thraka comes back. But hey, we've got Primaris to throw at them. Maybe Let's Yark. talk about Yark will come out of retirement just for this. They're gonna get the band back together. I mean, if we get Yark, we could get Ragnar Blackmane. It'll be great. And Caiaphas Kane. Oh well, yeah. In the mix. We need our top men: <laughs> Yark, <laughs> Ragnar, Caiaphas. It needs to happen. Oh my god, I would love for Yark and Caiaphas Kane to work together make this happen because he's mentioned he mentions in several stories where he's like yeah I've met Yark he's kind of a dick like I never knew I needed something so badly in my life I mean Anyways. I don't know why Annandale couldn't do it he's written Space Wolves he wrote Yark. I kind of want Sandy Mitchell to write it though because I would love to see we his have, take we on Sandy Yarick Mitchell and Ragnar write the chapters of Caiaphas Kane. this could be fun Ooh, and then we could have Annandale do Yarrick, and we could have ADP do Ragnar, Bam. and then... This is the best idea it, ever. It'd be the best game of telephone ever. It really, like, really would. It really would be. And then Yarrick walked down the hill. Your turn. <laughs> like, because the Caiaphas Kane chapters would just... 
Like, I would like to imagine it would be like a beautiful symphony. And then all of a sudden, just a clashing cymbal. <laughs> that would be, that would be kind of his kind. I just. And then York comes yeah. in and it's just like the sad trombone. <laughs> oh my God. It, no, it would be something really serious. Like, I don't know. Some real serious, like serious strings. Be lots of strings. Well, because Gaz Colbraca is going to be the tuba. Let, let's be real. Let's be fucking real. Yeah, that's going to be the tuba and a bunch of brass. Um, and then Ragnar Blackmane is just going to be drums, menacing drums. And then Caiaphas Kane can come out on the triangle. <laughs> ding! <laughs> or the cowbell. We need more cowbell! More cowbell. Ding! Ding! <laughs> be amazing. Anyways, let's oh talk my... about the overarching threat within God. this book. If we could, like, drop a line to Nick Kime and be like, so, dude, I don't know. Please, make like, it happen. You need to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> make it a limited edition. You will sell 11 billion copies yes. of it. Um, so let's talk about the overarching thing here. Speculation time. Hmm. What's going on with Bukharis's ring? Don't care. I really don't. I'm actually, that was the only part when I got to the end where I was like, I actually loved when Colquan's like, yeah, the artist just sucks. And he's like, actually, <laughs> I totally imagined, because I didn't like Madeira as a character, I imagined him being like, actually, <laughs> when he's like, we actually looked into this and apparently they drew it as they saw it and it's Blackstone. I, and then that's that makes when, this. That's when Colquan raised an eyebrow like, wait, wait, it's made of what? <laughs> I love that because even Bobby's like, that's not how Blackstone works. Like, none of this makes sense. But that whole thing when he basically lays out, like, look, the planets fell. They were the opposite of Cadia. They fell before the invasion happened. Like, when he mentions, like, it's like a bow wave. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting to me like th the whole idea of bringing something from the age of apostasy back into relevance is interesting in general but uh especially Blackstone? since Gullivan has really no idea what the age of apostasy is technically. no everybody else is and that's what I think what makes it interesting is because if they were like well this happened before the heresy Gullivan could be like actually that's not how that happened because I was there um or if it's something that's happening now, right? Like the Space Wolves or Marnius Calgar or any other Legion could be like, mm, that's actually not what's going on because we've been part of it. But when you put it in the middle history there, you're kind of relying on hoping, hoping that the 10,000 have heard of it. Right. And so the Age of Apostasy, sort of there's really not books in the Age of Apostasy, right? That's mostly like from the, the game codices, the info. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, it's just interesting, especially given the whole historical aspect, like the whole this whole book. I was like, God, what is the point? Why are they here? Oh, that's why they're here, because when you live in a world that's constantly, constantly, basically, when you live in the peak 60s, 70s Soviet Russia, where they are constantly hiding and changing the message and altering history because you don't want the message to get out. It makes control. for real interesting. It was control the message. Control the information. Control the message. Makes it real interesting when all of a sudden uh, we need to know what happened 2,000 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, whoops. Yeah kind of shows the short-sightedness which, which actually is something that was kind of hinted on the beginning of um, dark imperium where robbie bobby was like he was trying to basically like what's happened in the last ten thousand years and kept nothing running, kept running into problems with the inquisition saying you don't need to know that and he's like excuse you what do you mean i don't need to know that like do you know who i am and he's probably the only one who can get away with saying that to be totally honest um that's the other people, by the way, that I was like, does he not realize the space wolf? He's making the space wolves act like this. Like the Inquisition, right? Is like, I mean, who the hell are you? Well, I am the son of the emperor. And and then, yeah, you have the space wolves who are like, we're loyal to the Allfather. Fun fact, I just talked to him. And he put me in charge and he asked me to, like, do stuff. And... I guess that's it. 
like, yeah, that drove me a little crazy too. But no, it's, it's very interesting that I feel like the new, I feel like almost feel as though the ring is the MacGuffin. I feel like the real villain here is the fact that they don't know anything that happened. If it didn't happen right now, right in front of my eyes, we don't really know. And the Inquisition has either burned all records or just not going to let anything out about it. Hell, the Inquisition probably doesn't know. That's actually one thing I really enjoyed about um, uh, the Red Tithe. Was showing how stupid the Inquisition is and how they're their own worst enemy about stuff. Their own worst enemy. I mean, how did this happen? Well, we got to delete all these records. Yeah, that's happened before. That one remains our, like, again, perhaps one of the most interesting things we've come across. Because that, I think, really pretty much hit the nail on the head, the problem with it's the Inquisition yes. in general. So it's like, oh, yeah. Did it ever occur to you that maybe that's why there's a blank spot in the records? Because you guys keep the Because remember, it? they mentioned that. They kept mentioning that. Yeah. They're like, God, the records are spotty. Yeah, Funny well, that. When you keep deleting them because you don't like what's in them. Gets a little weird, doesn't it? Yeah, talk about controlling that message. <sighs> now, I think, so here's here's my wild supposition. Hmm. That I really kind of hope comes to pass. Remember, one of the things I said is that I, it, when we first started reading a lot of these, was that I was like, I almost feel as though Bob is going to be fighting a war on two fronts. One is going to be a legit straight up war. And the other is going to be more of a cold war. And that's going to be against the Inquisition. Yes. And I feel like the Imperium is going to have a heresy part two. But it's going to end up being like the martial end and the administrative end. This whole Bukharis thing. I feel like is pointing in that way. The portents. Possibly. Possibly. Because the you, word. Because you already, because you have like a bad Ecclesiarch, right? And Robbie Bobby's obviously not really happy with Ecclesiarchs. That he just, with the cult of the Emperor and the Ecclesiarchy in general. Mm -hmm. the Inquisition covering things up. I mean, it's all um it's all very interesting. And I am curious like where this is where this is going to go and how this is all because we all because we know what the Indominus Crusade is. It's all about him settling things between the two Imperiums so that he can start the real work. Because that's how Dark Imperium started was yes. when the Indominus was over. Mm -hmm. That just reminded me. One other criticism I have in this book, and it's a and it's a Space Wolves thing. It's not Gav Thorpe's fault. Their fucking words for things. Like, Everdust took me forever to figure out. And I'm sure it was mentioned... Oh. Sure that doesn't mentioned. bother me. Okay, I'm sure that was mentioned earlier, like what it was, but I just didn't catch it. But I was just like, what the fuck is this? What are they saying? Anyway. That one doesn't bother me. But the one, so like if you remember in Chris Raitt's books, it was Varengi. In this book, it was Varengir. And like they had all these different names. Like I am Harthen and I am this and I am that. And I'm like, look. Not everything needs to have an EGHN thrown on the end of it. Well, at least there was to make a glossary. It sound. Yeah, I did like the glossary, but, but even then, I was like the glossary, so that didn't help me there. With no, the, and that's what, I it, like some of their stuff, but some of it, I'm like, it's like, this I, is necessary. like I understand you've made you've made the point here that Fenris is not really part of the Imperium, and they have their own language, and their own words for things. Okay, if you're going to have a glossary of Fenrisian. Or I forget what the name of their language is. That's great. I, I Juvik. 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 Yeah. That's great. But please include the slang. All right. I'm I'm kinda with you there. Like make a glossier gra bleh, a glossary or don't make a glossary. None of this like one foot in, one foot out. Right. None of this cats is coming back to Broadway bullshit. It just Go and look at the X Men Gambit episode for that reference. Um, X E X Men. Um, I yeah, some of their words, but like also the, there seemed to be no consistency about it. Like the way that they introduced themselves, I'm like, I've never heard him call himself this before ever. And then like 
anyways, yes, I'm with you on that one. And I forget what I point I was making or you were making when I interrupted. Um, about the well, I think we were just saying in, in general, like there's just again, the, the book just has some problems and that I don't really understand where it's going either. Like either you're going to break the Imperium, like you're going to lead this up to if this just turns out to be one thing where they're like, OK, and now we've destroyed the one ring of power and we can go off and do whatever we want to do. I'm going to be real angry. If this whole thing becomes a quest to break Bukharis's ring. I have a feeling that's going to be like just kind of what's going on in the background. So what I'm hoping is that so I'm so happy I got to see this moment with Robbie Bobby interacting with the Space Wolves. I was like, I'm, I was so excited when that happened. We've already seen him interact with the Blood Angels. Because we, yes. we read uh, Devastation of Ball when he comes in and like brings in the Primaris Marines and basically gives Dante a hug and is like, you're my best ever. And then goes home and kicks Marnius Calgar. But <laughs> I would like one of these books to be about when he beats with the Dark Angels. I have a feeling that that's going to be like, or I have a feeling that it's scars or the Raven Guard. Like, I don't really care about the Iron Hands, but sorry. Nobody does. <laughs> right. <laughs> I I have a feeling it's going to be a lot of that. It's going to be a lot of, but okay, and now he's going to just check on this chapter and then this chapter. How I, about the Salamanders? That should be Nick Kimes' book. Yeah. How about them? But if this all just turns out to be one big magical MacGuffin thing, I'm not going to be happy with it. Like, I'm hoping this actually progresses. And I don't know how long the series is supposed to be. The Donna Fire series. Like, if, if they're going to make it basically a book about every legion? I thought be like, I read somewhere it's going to be 12 books. But, you know, I don't know. So then maybe, like, the other books are going to be kind of like this, where they're progressing the main plot, but also, like, meeting the Dark Angels and meeting everybody else, and but also progressing the plot. I, I don't want another book where it's like, here's all this stuff that happens, and in the last ten pages we'll tell you, we'll progress the Bukhara story a little bit. I hope not. That would be disappointing. I agree. It would be a little disappointing. Having said that, I am glad. Like, I, I love, I do appreciate all of this world building because this is the Indominus Crusade and this is like the major lore changes. Mm -hmm. um, I am happy that the next book we're reading. Oh. Are we? I don't know. Are... Hold, please. So we put up a poll. To see which book we were reading, if it's Steel Tread or Volpone Glory. I left my Volpone Glory somewhere. And the winner is Steel Tread is the winner. So I'm really excited about this because we just, I feel like we don't get to read just books about the Astra Militarum all that much. Um, also... I feel like I deserve awards that I am now calling the Master of Militarum and not the Imperial Guard. Anyways, I'll I'm really your, excited about it. I'll put your award in the mail. Stop it. Um, I'm excited to get just a good Astra Militarum novel in. And more importantly, I feel like we haven't gotten to read much of Andy lately. So I'm really excited. Uh, probably not since Gate of Bones. That's was, probably accurate. Which was like, I was actually looking through this earlier today, which was last January. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So I was looking at the order of books that I read through Goodreads and Data Bones was the first one in January. You are absolutely correct. Wow. Okay. So it's been that long. It has been one calendar year. Is this going to be a tradition that we're just going to start off every year reading? Because didn't we read Shroud of Night early in the year too? Like, we just have to start our new year. Do you mean Dawn of Fire? No, no, I mean Shroud of Night. When we read Shroud of Night two years ago, I think we read it toward the beginning of the year, too. 
I feel like maybe we're just going to start, or we read Celestine, maybe? One of them. We're just going to have to start every new year reading an Andy Clark book. So no pressure, Mr. Clark. Dance but for we us, need monkey, to... dance. <laughs> but we just need you to put out a book over the beginning of every year. Just no pressure. Okay, so I'm looking at Gate of Bones. February. Yeah, we read it, and well, we podcasted about it in February. So, yeah. Um, and by the way, when they mentioned Akalor being dead, I was like, too soon. Okay, so the first book that we read in 2020 was Lords of Silence. Yes, and I do remember. Um, but and then I felt like we read an Andy Clark one. We very did. Close Fist, of the that. Uh, Fist of the Imperium. It was like two months after that. Oh. Right. Right. That was a book that happened. It was a book that happened. But I am very excited for this one. I think um, as much as I like a good lore progression and a good lore shakeup and a good primaric appearance, because who doesn't love her boot, Gullivan? Um, wow, we read Shroud of Night and Celestine almost back to back. Uh, Apocalypse separated the two of them. Okay, then. It's kind of fun. All right. Through this. It is kind of fun, actually. This... Some of the books that we read, like, we've we've read some good stuff. So I'm excited for this one. I think it should be good. Um, I mean, this one, the good news is... I, I like how thick it is. I need a break. <laughs> Seriously. Um, the good news about this one is, similar to the book that we just read, it's also available on Audible. I know that we have a lot of audio-only fans, so... Man, I I'm sure there's going to be as... lots of ochre. I say it's not as thick, but still got a lot of pages and they're just the papers look a little thinner. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's gonna be a good one. I'm excited. Yeah, it um good. Yeah, it should be good. I'm I like Andy Clark's style. So hopefully yes. this one. I think the only one we didn't like was Fist of the Imperium. And mostly because Gene Steelers. And I don't remember. It still had one of my Favorite, favorite, I really don't badass remember very teams. much about it, except that it had a Imperial Fist librarian. That's really all I remember. It actually had one of my favorite badass scenes in it, yeah. and it's the one where all of the nobles are like, okay, so you're getting us off the planet. Thank God you're here to rescue us. And he's like, hold up. Like, we are not the rescue squad. We are the oh no shit's fucked squad. That was. We're not rescuing any of you people. We're just here to like secure the planet. Right loved and everybody's like excuse me <laughs> i loved that whole scene um so yes it david, should be a good one david geimer actually wrote a kind of a similar scene in one of his um iron hands short stories and so mm -hmm. basically the planet is falling to shit because of orcs and everything like right that. they're all being overrun but there's this one tech priest that has this vital information and so they see that space marines are overhead one iron hand drops down. They're like, is that going to be enough to save us all? And he's like, I'm here for the info. <laughs> Pretty much takes the tech priest because she's like, oh, it's stored in my head. You can't get it out of me without my permission. So he has to take her. It's like, well, later. And they're like, but we're all going to die. Yeah, sorry. That's not why I'm sorry. here. <laughs> not my circus, not my monkeys. Yeah. I was like, well, that was just cruel. Pretty much. That was, but That was way harsh. Yeah, but you know, but I forget ago. that it's like that. You know, when I started up, actually, you know, uh, the Space Marine game for the first time in years, it's kind of fun watching it now. Now that I know about Space Marines, so it's a little interesting. But the very beginning, of course, I didn't remember this because I didn't know about it. Yes, they knew the planet was overrun by orcs, and they're like, "Should we do exterminatus?" Oh wait, there's a manufactorum with titans. <laughs> Uh, we should get those first. Like <laughs> we kind of need that one. Like, that's so heartless. Oh Pretty much, God. but I mean, it's it's very much a look. The Imperium's an omelets and eggs type of they place. They are. They are. You want to take us out, Carrie? Yeah, sure. Well, with that, like you know, kind of happy note. So, you've listened to the Warhammer 40k Book Club episode regarding the Wolf Time by Gav Thorpe. Be sure to check us. Yeah, check us out next time for Steel Tread by Andy Clark. So we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, oh my God, if you like this episode, 
Sorry. Please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those good things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. And can we, we didn't say this earlier, but Happy New Year, everybody! Happy New Year! 2022 is going to be great, right? Don't, don't say anything. Don't touch anything. Just let it come in quietly. Touch. If your year sucks, it's Carrie's fault. I'll take it. Everything's usually my fault anyway. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.